Okay. Before going into the issue, let me just recall some issues that you already re uh, remember. The issue of the principal stresses. You know that uh, every stress state or every second order tensor, which is represented, represents a stress state, uh, can be uh, obtained from these, from it, what is called the principal directions and the principal stresses. Uh, engineers, we talk about principal planes or principal directions and principal stresses. Mathematicians talk about principal eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But essentially, it's the same. So it can be proven that there is uh, a system of Cartesian axes in which the components of the stresses of the stress tensor become the, the, the matrix of components become becomes diagonal. There is always this system which is an orthogonal system, so that means that there are three planes, which corresponds to the normal, to this si system of coordinates x prime, in which the stresses are that, so it means that on every of these planes only acts a normal stress. There are no shear stresses in the traction vector on those planes. And there is always that, and if we just compute the stresses, the normal stresses on these three planes, and we order that so that sigma 1 is the first one in magnitude, sigma, sigma 2 is the, second, is the second one in magnitude, and sigma 3 is the third one in magnitude. You already are familiar with that. How do we compute the principal stresses? Well, in general, we have to apply mathematics, what is called Eigen, uh, Eigen analysis. What in, in, in maybe in, in Catalan is auto vectors, auto, auto valores, auto, auto vectores, auto valores, in which what we do is to diagonal, do, diagonalize the stress tensor, the stress matrix, uh, we, in, a, in a certain direction. We look for the that directions in which the strain matrix becomes diagonal, the stress matrix becomes diagonal. So how do we solve that? Well, that is a, the eigenvalue problem, which cons cons consists of finding what are the values of B, some vectors, that such that sigma times V equal lambda, lambda V in a certain parameter, which is a no, times V. So this equation, which is the eigenvalue problem, can be written in that way. The stress sigma minus lambda times the unity uh, tensor, so which this that, 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 that matrix, times V is equal to zero. This is an homogeneous system of equations, and you know that in order this homogeneous system of equations to have solutions, the determinant of the of the uh, the characteristic determinant of the equation, which is the determinant of this matrix here, has to be equal to zero. Otherwise there is no solution. So why how this determinant is zero? Well, if that determinant of this has to be zero. If we solve that equation, by the way, this is a scalar equation. The determinant is a scalar. But in computing that determinant, you see that, for instance, there will be the product of this term times this term times this term, which involves that at the end of the day, there will appear a lambda cube, a lambda to the three uh, in the equation, then there will be products that involve lambda to the 2, there will be products or terms in, in, in this determinant, in the exp analytic expression of this determinant that depends on lambda, and then there will be a, a term that doesn't depend on any lambda. So, finally, this is a cubic polynomial equation, which in general has, or it has, it can be proven, that this, if this determinant is symmetric, it has three solutions in terms of lambda. So that's a cubic equation, it has three solutions, and if we are able to find these solutions that are real, they do exist, then we obtain what are called the eigenvalues, which in our engineering world are the principal stresses once they are, are ordered at our convenience. And for, the, for every of these lambda, we can then solve this equation, which is now solvable, and then we obtain the three vectors, v1, v2, v3, corresponding to lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, which define the normal to all, all of these planes, so the directions of this. This is mathematics, I just recall it, but let me show something important. From the physical point of view, 
these three directions <coughs> have to be total, totally independent of on what is the original system of coordinates in which we express the stress tensor. So instead of this system, we had taken another system different, and we performed this process, we should obtain the same eigenvalues and same eigenvectors. So we, that that comes from our physical perception of the problem translates mathematically in the following. If the solutions in terms of principal stresses and the principal planes or principal directions have to be independent of the original system of coordinates that we had used, we have used used to um, represent the stress tensor, then the solution of these polynomials have to be independent of the system of coordinates. And these solutions to be, for these solutions, be independent of the system of coordinates, what do you think has to happen? What do you think? That if I solve, if I establish a state this solution in that system of coordinates, or if I state this solution and in other, another system of coordinates, orthogonal, of course, and I want to find through those, these two different systems of coordinates, what would have to happen for the solutions to be the same? Well, the coefficients of the, co the equation has to be the same. In other words, the coefficient of the equation has to be the same. So in other words, through this reasoning, we have found that even that given a stress tensor, given a stress tensor, there is, as we change the system of coordinates, the, comp the matrix of components of the stress tensor will change. We know that. But there are some combinations, some combinations of the stress components that in spite that we change the system of coordinates, these combinations do not change. Which are these combinations? I1, I2, and I3. So that is what I1, I2, and I3 are called invariants, because it's proven that they depend on the stresses, on the stress components, but even if the, the stresses components change as we change the system of coordinates, these combinations do not change. So in other words, these combinations can be used to represent the physics of the problem. Because if you want to represent the physics of something, and this, some, this physics changes depending on the system of coordinates that we use, that is not useful many times. We are not representing the physics. We are representing the way that we uh, uh, the, the, the observe the situation. So in general, in physics and in mechanics, we look for magnitudes that are independent of the system of reference. And that is why the invariants are very good, very appropriate magnitudes to represent properties of our materials. And that is what is important here. So these uh, invariants, which are called I invariants, can be expressed in that way. The first one is the trace of sigma. So the trace of sigma doesn't change even if we change the system of components. It's an invariant. The second invariant is that, the double dot of sigma minus I1 squared. So, uh, 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 by the way, then, if we represent that invariant in the case of the principal stress directions, that is sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. The second invariant, it can be proven to be that, and then, in terms of the principal stresses, can be uh, represented like that, and the third invariant is the determinant of sigma, which is, uh, that in terms of the, of the principal stresses, can be computed as the sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. Okay. So, that's important. That's important. We have found some scalar magnitudes that are representative, somehow represent the stress state, and they do not change as we change the system of coordinates, are invariants with respect to the system of coordinates. Keep that in mind. Of course, if a certain function of the stresses is invariant with respect to the system of coordinates, the combination of any of the algebraic combination of them don't, don't vary anywhere, doesn't vary anywhere. So, for instance, if I1, I1 is invariant, I1 plus I2 will be invariant too. If I1 is invariant and I2 is invariant, I1 times I2 are invariant too. So that is why sometimes we work in what are called the J invariants, which are more appropriate 
combinations of the, uh, the i invariants. For instance, the j invariant 1 is equal to, to the i invariant 1. The j invariant 2 is 1 half of i1 squared plus 2i2. It is invariant 2, but it has a simpler representation. And the, the j invariant 3 is that, and it has a simpler representation. Okay? This formula can be expressed in a condensed way, in a compact way, in terms of this. Okay? So, first point, keep in mind, there are invariants. Invariants that are good in the sense that they can be appropriated to represent properties of the materials or to characterize the behavior of the material. Okay? And we'll take advantage of that. And there are infinite of those invariants. For instance, sigma 1, the principal stresses, sigma 2, the second principal stress, and sigma 3 are also invariants. Okay? Because they do not depend on the change of coordinates. Okay? They are always the same. Okay? So, there are many of these invariants, and some of them are used, and we'll go back to that. Another concept that I want to recall is the concept of the, spheral, the spherical and deviatoric part of any tensor, and in particular of the stress tensor. So we know that we can compute the mean stress as the trace of the stresses divided by stress, by three, which is an invariant in itself, it's an invariant in itself, which is one third of the, the trace. We have seen that the trace is an invariant, so one third of the trace is an invariant. And the mean stresses, and the pressure, of course, is minus the, 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 mean, the mean stress. And then we can construct, in terms of the mean stress, an hydrostatic stress of, uh, state of stress, which is the mean stress times the one. Okay? So that is, the, is the, the spherical part of the tensor. In particular, a hydrostatic, hydrostatic state of stress is one stress which, whose uh, that is just purely uh, spherical. So it, it has this, this form. Okay? So every stress tensor can be decomposed into its spherical part and its deviatoric part, and that's the formula for that. The spherical part is one, tra one third of the trace times the unity, and the deviatoric part is just the difference. Okay? There are several properties of that. We already have uh, studied that in chapter, th the chapter uh, f 4, devoted to stresses. Okay? Well, look, if we have one tensor with the stress tensor, and from its tensor, this tensor, we can obtain the deviatoric, the deviatoric part of this tensor, then that is another tensor for, wi for which we can compute the invariant. So we can com co compute the invariant i of the deviato deviatoric part, the deviator part of the stress tensor, and we name that I1 prime, I2 prime, I3 prime, and they are expressed in that way. And in the same way, we can compute the J invariants of the deviatoric part of the stresses, which are expressed in that, in that sense. Look that for, uh, an, for an a stress, a deviatoric stress tensor, I prime, which is the trace. The t what is the trace of the viatoric tensor? You know? We have studied that. The trace of any viatoric tensor is zero. My construction can be proven. So I1 is zero, I prime one, and J prime one is equal to zero two. But the other, the other uh, the invariants are no, no, no longer uh, zero. Look, now, as I told you, Every combination, every algebraic combination of invariants is also invariant. And one, one very uh, appealing measure to keep as representative of a stress state is what is called the effective stress or equivalent uniaxial stress. It's in a scalar. It's normally it's denoted by sigma with an upper bar. And it's defined as a square root of three times the, the, the second J invariant of the deviatoric part of the stress tensor. So the point is, if I, if I have a, st a stress tensor, I can obtain the, the, the spherical and the deviatoric, pa deviatoric part, and if I have the deviatoric part, then I can compute J prime two, and then doing this operation, I obtain the effective stress, which is a scalar. 
and it can be computed in that way. Typically, a square root of 3 over 2 sigma primes double dot sigma primes. Important of that. First, it's an invariant. Why? Because it's just an algebraic combination of invariant. So we can make sure that if I say that the stress state of this body has a sigma I can, in one point of this body, I can characterize the stress state by the effective uniaxial stress in that point. If I change the system of coordinates, or if I just turn that, the, the body in that way, that measure is not going to change, which is what I want. So what, what, what would be the usefulness of a measure that measures the stresses here, but as soon as I just give a rigid body motion or change the system of coordinates, which is the same, the measure changes. Okay? So I'm looking for something which is independent of rotations of the system of coordinates. Okay? So, so we can make sure that this is invariant. But there is another property of this invariant here is that it measures, so to speak, the intensity of the stress. So, of course, if I have the, a uniaxial stress, it's very e easy to determine the uniaxial stress. So, if I take a bar and I put a tension one, a stress one in tension at every end, the stresses are the intention, the, the, the intensity of the stress is one. If I put a stress two, value two, the intensity of the stress is two. If I put a uh, compressive stress minus one, the intensity of the stress is minus one. Okay, this is in uniaxial cases. But what about in three axial cases? I have lots of stresses, you know? I have the, the stresses, I have all these stresses. So how can I measure in just a single scalar if this stress state is very high or it's very low, okay? So very useful measure is that, because these effective stresses measures the intensity of the st all stresses in just a single number. So it's if this number is very high, that then means that there are large stresses in the place, in the point. If this measure is very small, that will mean that there are small stresses in the point. 